That's all. It sounds like a cliche. There's nothing like the house of God. There's nothing on earth like the house of God. There's a lot of things, but they're all on a different level than the house of God. I'm glad to be in the house of God. How about you? Let's thank you again.
but that is uh, interpreted as being compassionate to those folks. This is what the world we live in. California has one in four of all homeless people in America. Out of every four homeless people in America, one of them is in California. Uh, and so, all of this is going on. The governor announced this week that he wants to see at least half of all the parts of California to be electric by 90, by 2030. That's his nine years. Who knows? Who knows if there's enough electricity? Who knows what happens? It's all kind of up for grabs. And I am not saying that these people, in many cases, do not think that they are doing the right thing. But that in itself adds to the chaos where uh, there is a uh, disagreement on what the right thing is and, and that it has grown increasingly uh, raw. So uh, here we are. And then there's increasing regulation in many places as to what can be done in an attempt to clean up the atmosphere and um, in an attempt that other people who believe that climate change can be controlled by the actions of people, even though most of the nations of the world are paying absolutely no attention to climate control. Uh, the idea is to try to set an example and hope it helps. China, the largest nation in the world, doesn't do much about climate control. They're interested in dominion or control. So uh, all of this and much more that we can talk about tonight uh, is laying the foundation uh, for great men looking for answers, which is the title what I want to talk to you about tonight. Great men and men and women not so great are looking for answers in the world that we're living in. The church ultimately, um, although there are things that can happen beyond the control of the church or anybody else, and there are many things that have happened that have been terribly much worse than what you and I are experiencing much worse, hundreds of times worse, with people being killed in, by the tens of thousands and in places by the millions, and there's, there's terrible things that go on in our world. And so, um, in the middle of all that, though, in the part that we're involved in, you add to that the fact that you and I are children of God. We are not looking for survival level because we know we have a mandate and a call on our lives to bring the kingdom of God into the present world that we live in. And so we cannot go hide in a cave in Wyoming. And our primary goal is not just finding a peaceful place for ourselves. Our primary goal is doing the will of our Father. And so when we talk about doing the will of our Father, it changes the whole dynamic in terms of personal freedom, in terms of what's the right thing for you and I, in terms of what are priorities to you and I. All of that gets adjusted when we start recognizing that we are a people with a heavenly mandate, and you say amen. And our heavenly mandate is that our master is working to establish his kingdom in this world, and we are his disciples, from which the word discipline comes, which means you're not free to do anything you want. You have to have the discipline to do what your master wants you to do. We had communion this morning. One of the reasons the communion decided, and the pastor did such a tremendous job this morning, one of the reasons the communion decided foot washing is that communion is uh, like death. We're dying to ourselves, we're living to Christ. And foot washing is like slavery, where we are love slaves, not coerced in any way, shape, or form. 
but that we are servants to our brothers and sisters, and that is symbolized by the washing of feet. So the two things that humans hate the worst, which is death and slavery, are the two things which are central to our living for God. It's death to the flesh uh, and to our own interests, uh, and it is bondage to uh, our responsibility to our brothers and sisters and to the world. And so here we are caught in this riptide among all of the others and figuring what we can do or what we should do. And, uh, and uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a dynamic that many people have never faced. And it is a dynamic in which leaders are looking for answers and even great men are looking for answers. So with that said, I want to read one uh, scripture to you tonight that you will probably be somewhat familiar with in Genesis chapter 42 and verse number 1, and it reads like this. Now, this is Genesis 42 and 1. Now, when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do you look one upon another? And so tonight, what I'm preaching to you is not about survival level. Nothing about this church has ever been since its foundation about just survival. We don't preach about just survival. We don't live to just survive. We are on a different plane than that. And to do what God wants us to do, we have to find a road that leads to the meeting place of the greats, of the visionary, and of the prophet. So, and our mantra should be, uh, like the Muslims, God is great. But then our mantra is the kingdom of God is great. And then our mantra is we are heavenly people with a great future. And then our mantra is, is that his kingdom should be great in the earth. Uh, but we do not spread it with coercion and guns and bombs and trying to destroy governments. Uh, we spread it by the love of God, giving liberation, not politically, but liberation individually in the hearts of men and women. And so it's a digression of other teachings. And so uh, it should be that this is the most important thing in your life. The kingdom of God has been the most important thing in my life since I received the hope that was 13 years old. And it continues to be the most important thing in my life. It is the only eternal thing. Everything else that you're doing is with A and so. I don't care how rich you are, I don't care how pretty you are, I don't care what you are. Uh, if it's not tied around the kingdom of God, everything that's not of Jesus shall go down. Amen. It doesn't matter if your house is faithful or not faithful. It doesn't matter how much money you got in the bank. It doesn't matter who you work for. It doesn't matter what connections you have. If you're not connected to Him, and if you're not involved in the kingdom of God, it doesn't mean what? It doesn't mean anything. Amen. And so I'm going to go up with a cup of smoke before it's over. And so uh, we, we need to be the wisest in decision making during these times. We need to be the strongest in depth and breadth of character during these times. Uh, we need to be uh, the most filled with the glory of God and the most robust people in anointing. Thank God for the anointing that was here tonight. Amen. And when people see the kingdom of God in times like this, it is especially important that we are filled with the Spirit. Because the darker it gets, the more supernatural miracles you're going to see take place. And uh, we are seeing them. We're going to see more of them. We're going to see God bear his right arm in America. We're going to see God, especially in places like this, where people think of it as being totally oppressed or suppressed or all the other things. Uh, we're going to see the glory of God bear his arm in ways that people can't even imagine. I'm excited to be right in the dead world. Uh, that's me. 
And I, I, that, that, that bothers me. I don't know what I Even if you don't have a lot of strength to step into it, I want you to see those possibilities. I want you to see the glory of that world. I want you to see the beauty of that world. And just by being a part of the people that steps into it and does your little part, you get exposed to that. And that changes you. And that makes you different from what people are. It makes this church different from churches down the street that are just going through the rituals. It gives you a purpose and a meaning in your life and a glory and a beauty that you can't get any place in But the most successful tyranny is the one that removes the awareness of other possibilities other than what people see in front of their nose. Uh, I want to I remove those things. Uh, I want you to be able to see the possibilities. I want to talk about Sacramento tonight. Uh, I want to talk about California tonight. Uh, I want to talk about the future of all of it tonight. Uh, amen. While other people that are leaders are giving their voices up, uh, we're going to give our voice tonight. Uh, because I know that we have come to Mount Zion, the city of God. Amen. We've come to an innumerable host of angels. We've come to the spirits of justice and a perfect and a dynamic perfection. Amen. We don't have nothing to take the top head about. Nothing, nothing to bow our heads about. It's just a magnified name of God. Genesis 26, likewise, is the response of Isaac's generation and Genesis 42, 
Likewise, it is responsible for Jacob's generation. There are three of them, all of them experienced family. All saw and everything was dry and parched and maybe burned to the ground. Once in a while, I wonder if God says, okay, you decide to burn all your cities down, I'll just burn all your forests down. In California. So, um, all of them experienced famine and, and what it was like to have negative circumstances to live in. Abraham's famine came about 100 years before Isaac did. Isaac's famine was a number of years, we don't know exactly how many, before Jacob's famine. The sons of uh, Isaac, Jacob, and Esau were likely boys when Isaac's famine occurred. And so, by the time you get to Jacob, his daddy had been through famine, his grandfather had been through famine, but their responses were diametrically the opposite, as we will see. And so, all of the circumstances here are eerily similar and obviously uh, divinely placed for my learning and your learning tonight. All of them face the same famine. All of them face the same thing, and all of them face it in the same land. All of them have the same decisions to make. All of them have the same circumstances and the same hopeless dryness. And so, let me first say, as much as we want to feel like we're the first ones in history that's ever faced the uh, adversity that we face today, uh, that is far from the truth. That adversity in most places has been the norm in life rather than the exception. But we as a people have been blessed. Now we're seeing some of the tumultuous way that the world operates. Uh, and so first was Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. You have to turn there. This is also the first mention. In these famines, all three of them went or were tempted to go to Egypt. And Pastor just mentioned this for a short moment last week. And, um, and so, uh, when you look at this, you will find that the first mention of Egypt in the Bible is this story, Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. And uh, it's a bit odd that this story about Abraham and famine is there. All of his stories virtually are extremely successful stories, uh, but this one is put there. And when you look at this story and you see that he went to um, uh, Egypt because of the famine in, in uh, Canaan. When you look at that, you try to find out did he disobey God or did God tell him to go there to preserve him or was there any way for us to discern here which was the case. But the text either supports or rebukes Abram uh, for this temporary journey of his which turned out to be temporary away from the promised land. Uh, Abraham, it looks like from the story, does seem to do what is humanly logical in the time of the famine, and that is go to a place where there is still plenty of food. It seems like that he did what was reasonable. And uh, however, that doesn't necessarily make the right decision. He is attempting to extrapolate what to do out of the present. He's trying to decide the future out of the present. Biblically speaking, you can never decide the future out of the present. It's a, it's a bad way to determine what the future is going to be except in, uh, in, in short-term situations. Uh, and so, uh, like many people today, they're making the decision on what to do uh, wherever they're living. Uh, they're, 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 just, they're making those decisions on the forecasts of uh, news people or uh, uh, people who take polls up. Uh, they're making their decisions based on predictions or on possibilities or on prognostications about what is coming uh, down the line. Or they're making them based upon present circumstances. Uh, in many cases, they have absolutely no spiritual attunement, and it doesn't look like Abraham had much there either. And they have no visionary knowledge by revelation. Except that Abraham had one.
one thing that should have helped him that doesn't seem like he was yet, he was yet attuned to, to what I'm about to say. And that is that uh, we don't know exactly why he did all of this. Uh, we would assume he should know the answer, but it doesn't look like he did or thought it through. And uh, the one thing we do know is that God gave Abraham a land. God gave Abraham one land. And in the midst of famine, that is the land that he is leaving behind. And the land God gave him is Canaan. This is the land of opportunity. It's the place of the promises to Abraham and to God's people. It is the only place on earth until today that the Bible very clearly uh, signifies that was a piece of actual real estate given to a people that God gave them the land of Canaan and that it was a land of promise for God's people. Uh, it was God's gift to Abraham and God's gift to the people that came after him. They didn't get this from digging it out from scratch. Beware of the self-made man who claims he's done everything for himself. He does not how he got this. That's not God's land. That's foreign territory to the people of the promise. That's human pride and personal humor speaking. You didn't get it that way if you got it from God. You got it from God because it is a gift of God. He gave this land to them for Abraham to live in. And Abraham made a choice to leave that land because for a little, little faith lapse there, he forgot that this was the land promised to be uh, plenty. The Canaan land was not fully developed. In, in fact, at that time, as we pointed out, it was in famine. But Canaan land you have to look at not just in the present. You can't live for God without looking at the bigger picture. The Canaan land was the gift of God to Abraham of a platform or a base where great things would take place. And it was provided everything that would be needed for it even yet to be the greatest nation on earth. Uh, provided was all of the minerals and elements necessary, even though they hadn't been mined. Uh, and all of that was enough to become the leading kingdom of the world, in fact, forever. Its geographical setting was determined by God. God had already determined that the establishment of this worldwide kingdom would be in a place that, if you know a little bit about geography, Israel is in the place between the Mideast and the Far East. It's in the place just uh, below and east of Europe. The Mediterranean Sea is the top of Africa. The known world is connected to Israel and the Mediterranean Sea. The outlet of the Mediterranean Sea is to the west, and if you go out to the west, it takes you out into the great shipping lanes of the world uh, that go all the way to New York City. If you go down to the Dead Sea, there's nothing there now. The prophecy tells us that will open up, and there will be great shipping and fishing that will go through there all the way down to the Gulf of Aqaba. And, so, and come out down, on down, at the Indian Ocean. And so there is no land in the geographical setting, uh, certainly not Egypt, that has the geographical setting that does Israel. And so uh, the weather, the atmosphere, the sea, the land, have all uniquely got pent up in them the potential waiting to burst out with supernatural display. However, right now, it doesn't look that way. Right now, Egypt looks better. Right now, with the famine on and the heat and all that is going on in the parched land, 
It doesn't look like what God promised it to be. But you have to remember that God has never promised another place on the earth that would have the kind of riches and glory that Canaan is going to have under the leadership of God's people. And of course it all represents spiritual realities. Uh, that is in the church and it's where God placed you physically, where you got the Holy Ghost, where God has put you, uh, that determines whether or not uh, you will ever know the glories that God has, or whether you will live out your life in Egypt, in which I'll just uh, talk about in just a minute. And so, uh, when it came to this, Abraham had to realize that, Abraham, you can go down to Egypt, it doesn't mean that you're going to become a whoremonger of some kind. You can go down to Egypt, but it's not the land, it's not the purpose, it's not the place that I gave to you as a starting point. It doesn't have what the land that you're leaving has. There's going to be a point that if you ever get there, you're going to have to come back to this point uh, and you're going to have to say, God, give me this riches uh, that is in this land. And so here it is. He goes. Canaan was the gift of an unfinished divine plan. Amen. Now it's true that other nations have promises in the Bible. Other nations have promises. Uh, but not promises like this place, somewhere near. You have, you have, Abraham, you and your children have a chosen place. Uh, you don't choose it. You don't determine it. You don't disdain such an opportunity as this without a great loss. Uh, and the wheels which grind out the results of human decisions often grind slow. Abraham. We're going to take this trip down. Maybe God didn't specifically tell him he did not go to Egypt. Bible doesn't say it specifically told him he did not go to Egypt. It does say that God promised him with lavish and verbose kinds of promises. Uh, many of them descriptive and explaining what Canaan was. But right now, what it looks like to the physical eye is giving Abraham a different picture than what God has given to him in his spirit that made him obedient in the first place. Uh, and so, you've got to remember that Canaan is the only place that God placed him, that he promised him to be great. If he got out of that, God didn't give him any promises to be great. God didn't give him any promises at all of the lavish amount of power that's necessary to carry out the kingdom of God. You can get out of the will of God. You can, you can do it your way. Not very often in my life have I done that, but there have been a few times that I've done that. And uh, when I got out there by myself, I found out, my God, have mercy. How in the world? I'm not talking about sinning. I'm talking about making mistakes when when there was a little boy saying that's not the right decision on this particular thing. And, 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 and when you do those things on, on a massive scale, when you make those mistakes on a massive scale, on a large scale decision making process in your life, uh, uh, we're living right here on the razor's edge right now. I'm preaching while we're living in a place uh, at a time when people are saying they're shook up. They're not sure what to do. They're not sure how to handle themselves. They're not sure where to go. But in the middle of all of that, we're going to get stories here that are going to give us some directions tonight on what we do and how we get out of the mess uh, and what the right direction to go is. And so, uh, even though other nations have promises, nobody has promises like this. Uh, and the place where the generations of his families uh, would be given an opportunity to be great is in pain. And uh, so you've got to you gotta say caution to the man uh, that sees where to make himself great at the expense of not thinking through all of the opportunities. He may get personal greatness there for himself, but the decision he makes is, is going to rebound and it's going to be a decision for his wife. It's going to be a decision for his kids. And it's going to be a decision for his grandkids. And it's going to be a decision for his great grandkids. 
So it's not about just having a place. It's not about just having a land. I'd go so far as to say it. It's not about just having a church. There's a lot of differences. There's probably a few people in America that reach in more churches even right now, much less the decades that have gone by than I have and that I do. And I will tell you that there's a lot of things that conspire and come together to make a church even have a chance to ever become anything great uh, or see great possibilities. Uh, it's not the ingenuity of a bunch of people, but the Holy Ghost administrates that and brings that all together. And it's not the same. And you can get in situations where you can be saved, but miss what God has because during the famine, you went to Egypt. Now, thank God Abraham gets back. He learned from his bitter experiences that a man cannot be in his own strength and wisdom and maintain uh, the direction of his own life directly. And uh, he also finds out that adverse circumstances, and this is really important for all of us right now to realize, adverse circumstances are often meant to work for our good. That a good man may fail even in his good virtues uh, and, and not recognize that that, that pain is part of growth and that, and that experiences that are not pleasant are developing strength and patience and the necessity to step back from that eager spirit that wants to just conquer in a second and to plan on a broader scale and to see things on a wider scale and to understand those structures that God has placed in the church to help us in, uh, in making decisions that don't have to do with just today as to whether there's some kind of little deal that may make a quick decision that I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. But there's all kinds of things involved in this. Uh, and there's sometimes uh, that you've got to tough it out. There's sometimes that you've got to say, it's tough, but I'm tough. There's sometimes you've got to say, bring it on. Uh, and you're not backing me up. Uh, Like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? 
And he says to them, why do you look at one another? In other words, it's such a hopeless and undecided man. You guys suck it up. Talking to his boys. And then he said, I heard that there's torn in Egypt. Now I'm going to talk about Egypt a little bit tonight. I'll talk about Canaan a little bit. Uh, Egypt is a place that's going because of the famine, which directs the whole attention of their minds to themselves, not their purpose, not the kingdom, not their destiny. And so, when you get into trials, trials can engender doubt as to God's divine care. Uh, it can give us an exaggerated estimate of past and present difficulties. And we may take recourse to a direction that is not the best. We're exposed to the sin of tempting God when we get into these times of situations. And we may, we may be, this is important, tempted to preserve a lesser good at the expense of a greater good. And so, in other words, I've got to preserve myself when my, when my frantic, panic button is pushed. And I've got to preserve myself. And so I preserve myself, but I don't preserve the destiny that was meant for me. And so, because I'm not looking at a myopic at that point, I'm looking just at myself. And because I'm not looking at the me that God sees, the destiny, I make decisions that, that destroys the possibilities of that destiny. And so, I want to talk about Egypt a little bit. Because I think people spiritually go to Egypt during times of famine, and some people think that means that you meant they immediately backslid. That's not what I mean. Uh, what the relationship of Egypt to the people of God was and is has an impact globally and forever. Because we are people of eternal destiny, can you say amen? So, uh, like I said in Genesis 12, where the first famine came with Abraham, that is the first time the people of God were ever introduced to the world. Egypt represents the world. When I say that, I don't mean it in just its negative, most negative sense, but to the world in a, in a general sense in an at-large sense, both good and bad. This is where they got introduced to commerce. This is where they got introduced to uh, uh, the ways that the business is operating. This is where they got introduced to a lot of creativity that they had never experienced before. And, uh, and they experienced pursuits. And there are enjoyments that were in Egypt that they never heard of before. And so, uh, in that day, Egypt was a parent civilization of art and of all of the beauty and of learning and of world power. Many of the things that we still uh, use derive their original names from Egypt thousands of years ago. Uh, and so, and many of the people of Israel, their relationship with Egypt as to mean the wider world is repeated throughout scripture. Joseph ruled there. Jacob's descendants came and lived there for centuries. Moses, the Bible says, learned all of the wisdom of the Egyptians. Even in Christianity, one of the great centers, the two greatest centers of Christian development and, and, uh, and the Bible and all of those along with teaching, uh, one of them was uh, Byzantine uh, in, in Antioch, and uh, we read about the Book of Acts, and the other was Alexandria, where we read the Book of Acts as preachers coming from Alexandria, or that were from Alexandria. And Alexandria just became one of the greatest uh, libraries of Christian materials. 
uh, in the history of the world. So all of that was a part of Egypt. So I'm trying to just point out that you, when you talk about Egypt, it also has that depraved side to it. There's useful things there, like they learned vocation, they could, they could experience creative works, they could learn about management, and, uh, and, and so forth. But through all of that, there was also stuff there that uh, is the Hollywood of today, or stuff that is glorification for the flesh. And so regardless of how glorious Egypt is, this is the meeting place of the Bible and Egypt that we're at tonight in our society. It's the meeting place of Abraham and Pharaoh. It's the meeting place of the 12 sons of Jacob and Pharaoh. And out of all of that, there's several things that are made extremely clear. And one of them is, is regardless of how glorious Egypt is, it is not the sole and only promised land through which God's kingdom can be developed. It is not that. Egypt will never have it. And so when you leave to go to get corn in Egypt, you have left the better for the lesser. And I, when you say leave, what do you mean? I mean, when you leave the perfect will of God, or when you leave the opportunity that God uh, put together, constructed for you, when you leave that in a in a fit of panic, when you when you when you say, "I, I it's like I met a woman in Tulsa the other day uh, uh, at the hotel, and she was downstairs, and she's right next to a." Uh, a young person that I knew uh, at Pete, and I just can't believe the young person, how you doing? And this woman, oh, she's probably 50, she was standing there, and, and I said, how are you doing? She said, fine. I said, what are you doing? She said, well, he, she said, are you with the conference? Yeah. So uh, I said, what are you doing? She said, there's a conference here at the hotel uh, of people from counties all over America, and all the counties are trying to get together, and uh, Form political power to push back against the things that are destructive to our country. And she said, where are you from? I said, I'm from California. And immediately she said, oh, you need to get out of there right now. She said, that's where I was from. I got out of that place. Well, I didn't bother her. I mean, that was telling me it. She was kind of afraid. I mean, I don't want to stand here and argue logic where there's no opportunity at all of it ever returning. So, so no matter what anybody Not today's land of promise. There's only one place that's the land of promise. And that's the church.
it, it's, 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 I mean, look, 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 that's why they have a new championship every year, because it doesn't have any, it doesn't have any substance, so they have to do it over every year. They try to keep the thing floating. They may. There's, there's just, there's nothing there. And if you want to go further, you can go into no matter how homes, how many homes is a successful business, no matter how educated your children, if you, if you get out of the construct of where you fit in the kingdom of God, you left the better for the lesser. You lost the land of your inheritance. You can build your kingdom in Egypt, and uh, you may have faith the rest of your life, and you may come to the end of your life and say, see, you know, to see, I told you so. But I will tell you that you have forfeited your life of destiny for a life of earth security. And my home is going to be a thing called God's will. So that you can put your home where you want. You can put your, 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 the past in your life where you want. But it's about God's will. Where does God want me? Not where does God want me? Not where does God want me? Where does God want me? And what does God want me to do? So, so who is remembered today? They were old. Earlier. Who is remembered today? Egypt or Canaan land? God's people. Which one has an eternal destiny now, thousands of years later? And so I must be in the land of promise to fulfill God's some may say, I don't know, I'm in the room. Some of you don't need to have, some people haven't even thought enough about that to even consider. I don't know if I'm in the room. I don't know why. A lot of say, if God put you somewhere, then you need to set it until you get it figured out. Amen. So if Jacob makes his decision, there's corn in Egypt. Without having to reach the whole thing, there's corn in Egypt. His sons go there. He goes there. Everything looks good for a while. His grandkids are there. His great grandkids are there. They all prop and grow bigger, and Israel and Egypt gets afraid of them, and so makes them subservient, makes slaves out of them. So the man that puts his hopes in Egypt's best rather than Canaan's worst ends up with his kids in Egypt's slavery. It took a while to get there. Uh, I can tell you some stories, I can tell you some stories about people I've passed through through the years that they just thought they could just do what they wanted to, that God didn't care, all things were equal, that on and on it goes up. And now, if we were to look back, and I was to diagram the picture of your life, you would see a life of disappointment and a life that was not extended for the kingdom of God. All because they opted for the corner of Egypt. And I say amen. So, so, if you get to the place where you're one of the people that says, well, where is God's place? Well, you need to find somebody to help you get the place. And if you get in a deal where you say, what counsel does God place in my life? Well, that depends on where you're going to church. But some people don't take anybody's counsel because they, they have their own counsel. They have direct line to God that does not go through parents, does not go through elders, does not go through pastors, does not go through bishops. They have direct line to God that doesn't get anything from anybody else. Beware. They are a nurse. Amen. And so, um, all these things that happened, when they thought the land in which they lived would never Boom again. They scatter. So I like the other night uh, was Brother Shumak was talking and he said, it was John Shumak, and he's saying a 
of the Bay Area. They just sold the church. They're a lot of money. Uh, for more money than it is worth. But it's due to some circumstances that I think God created. And uh, so uh, people are all asking the question, uh, what are we going to do now, especially over there in the Bay Area and in Silicon Valley, where the price is high. And uh, I like what he said. He said, well, there's folks that think Silicon Valley is top out. And there's folks that would be happy to leave Silicon Valley and to leave San Jose if they could. But he said, I'm here to tell you that what's over for some folks is just starting for us. And if you look at the church, from what I've known the church since I was 15 years old, and if you look at the church where it's at today, it's never been where it's at today. You see, it's convoluted. You can't, you can't judge what's going to happen to the main thing, which is the kingdom of God, by judging what's happening to the society, whether it's business, politics, morals, schools, whatever it is. You can't judge what's going to happen to the kingdom of God by what's happening to society. The truth of the matter is, of the people that I preached for in the last year and a half, all that I can think of, without exception of anybody I preached for, without exception, the church has grown more. The income of the church to support the kingdom and the mission has grown more. More people have got the Holy Ghost. More people in the church have been blessed. It's just the reverse of everything going on in the world. But you have to understand, you cannot judge the direction of the kingdom of God by the direction of the Lord. When you do, you practice your case up and you believe it. And then you miss it. Get back. So, you know, uh, and, and you hear all this stuff about California. Sacrament, what's your name? Sacrament. Well, I don't know. Matt told me the other last week. That he's working on a building that's 427,000 square feet warehousing facility that's being completed. Half of it's always already rented to Simons, the other quarters rented to home people, and it's not even finished yet. And so, uh, Kubota Tractor, I, I don't know everything, but I know Kubota Tractor is putting in a new plant in Elk Grove at Grant Line in 99. And uh, I know I was talking to the landlord. At the school's office complex the other day, it's time to sign another lease. And uh, he said, he said, uh, now it may be that the lease space that we have, that we actually leave because we need more space. But he said, I don't see us leaving in the next two years. I said, well, why not if you need more space? He said, we're going to be holding on to what we have, but you can't find space in Elk Grove. For warehousing bigger than what we've already got. And it's a good size piece, but it's not that big. So I don't, you know, I don't know about all that. I, I just know that it looks like a mile long building they just put up out there uh, by the airport, some kind of distribution center. And uh, that is the highest home value information. I, mean, I just, I, I don't know everything, but I, I don't know all that's going on. But all of that does not determine what I'm doing. All of that doesn't determine what we're doing. What we're doing is we're committed to Sacramento. We're here. You can't, you can't push us out. You can't, you can't get it too bad for us to think that you can't do something. You can't, you can't get it too tight. You can't get it too tight because we know that God's hand is upon the people. Amen. And if we're all driving 1980 Kias or whatever they had in the 1980, it won't make any difference. We'll still be trucking on for Jesus because we know that God has got the church and we are in pain. We're not worried about what's happening out there in the world famine. We know God's got his hand on his people. Come on, stand up with me.
it's the exact same circumstances as Abraham and Jacob. It's the exact same land. It's the exact same temptations. It's the exact same needs. And it is the logical answer was exactly the same place that is Egypt. The difference is, the difference is, the only difference we can find is, is that this man hears from God. And hears God tell him, stay in the land. Stay in the land where I have put you. Now it seems preposterous when you look at Jacob and when you look at Abraham. But the truth is, is that Isaac saw the future not through the lens of the present, but through the lens of the voice of God. And he makes his decision based on revelational knowledge of the future. And then he works back to determine what he is going to do in the present. And he understands that this knowledge is not a process of study. Well, I read all the demographic reports. Well, I read about all the upcoming laws. Well, I read about all the new uh, restrictions. Going to be put. Well, I've read about all the. He doesn't see all of that. He sees an event in which all the pieces are going to come together, even though he doesn't know how. And he knows how they're going, that they're going to fit together. As outrageous as it sounds, as impossible as it sounds, the key is his attunement with God. And that attunement with God keeps him in the land of promise, in a famine, in which because he stayed there, as Pastor mentioned last week, the results of his faithfulness to his revelation was 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. To tell you how much a 100-fold is, is like like a hundredfold is a whole bunch. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> it's a whole bunch. Some of you with a mathematical degree. And the Bible says, then Isaac sowed in the land. You got to sow in the land. Yeah. Now I got to be a snack. I, I told Crystal and I said, Crystal, order me some new church business cards. I'm out of them. I want one that says, you're welcome at the Rock Church. And I said, now it's going to go from one to the other. I know it won't stay with the other, but it's starting with Indians. If you're an Indian here tonight, I'm after you. It's starting with Indians. And I've already started. And I saw two at a table next to me at Sister Wilson the other day. And they, they look like MS-13 Indian games. And I mean, tacks everywhere. And one of them was bigger than a house. And arms just stick around and I thought that's a good couple guys to start with. I walked up, I laid the card on the table, I said, I want you to look at this card and I want you to come see me. Are you guys doing good? And they said, oh yeah, and they were the friendliest people in the world, thank God. Amen. Yeah. That's just the beginning. Amen. I'm after the Indians. Amen. And when I get out there and I see other people, I know I'm going to be after them too. I don't care who you are. I'm coming. Amen. Because I'm, I'm, I know what God's going to do. Yeah. And it says, and the man waxed great and went forward and grew. He couldn't be very great for he had the thousands of flocks and herds and servants. And the Philistines envied him. Oh, hallelujah. That's where we're going. That's the key. And not only did he go back and dig out all the wells, which would give everybody water everywhere, but he, those wells were named in those days. But he, and the Bible says, he named them after the names that his father had given them. Instead of crying, I gotta come up with some newfangled names. I gotta, I gotta come up with a new, new way to preach. I gotta come up with a new, I'm, I've got to be cool, man. No matter what else I am, I've got to be cool. Well, I don't, but you know. Because I already am. 
But the deal was he knew who his daddy was. You gotta walk with your dad. You gotta stay with your dad. Give them a chance. Give them a chance. Bring them on. 